I'm here today with uh, Charles Glass, uh, author, journalist, and publisher. Uh, Charlie, uh, you and I go back, uh, as I was looking, almost 30 years now. Uh, it, it has been that long. Uh, and I think the fascinating aspect is uh, I was a special agent at the time, and you were a journalist that was kidnapped uh, in Beirut. So uh, I'd like to chat a little bit about that. Um, when you when you look back in that time frame, and I know you were kidnapped with the uh, son of the Lebanese defense minister, if memory serves me correct, is that right? That's Ali Ali Asadran. Do you recall, Charlie, uh, any evidence of you being surveilled before the actual kidnapping? Before I was taken, I wasn't aware of any surveillance. I discovered later when I got out that uh, I was under pretty close watch and that they had, uh, that the Hezbollah operatives who were watching me had sent uh, cables to Tehran, to the um, responsibles in Tehran asking whether or not they should pick me up and the message came back to the Iranian embassy in Damascus to tell Hezbollah indeed to pick me up. That's fascinating with that uh, direct uh, smoking gun with the Iranians uh, uh, and um, when you were picked up that day uh, what was running through your mind at the time of the abduction? Well, just before I was coming up from South Lebanon, where I'd been staying with my friend Alia Sairan, his father was, as you've said, the defense minister. And I wasn't um, apprehensive at all. I thought I was safe because he's from a very prominent Shiite family that um, we all thought would be untouchable. And I was going to go and have dinner with the Druze leader, Walid Jumblat, and then leave and go, go to Syria and continue a trip that I was making through the Middle East. Uh, so I was, I was actually rather self-confident that I'd had a few weeks in Lebanon, nothing had gone wrong, and everything would be fine. But as we were driving into Beirut itself through what are called the southern suburbs, which are areas of uh, then of slums of the South Lebanese Shiites who had moved into Beirut, fleeing the regular Israeli bombardment of their towns and villages uh, from the 1970s onward. And uh, it's a, an area teeming with... Um, well, poverty and all the political problems that Lebanon represents, as well as a, as a breeding ground for Hezbollah uh, militants. As we were coming into that area, an area called Uzai, along the seafront, uh, a green Mercedes pulled in front of us. And I noticed that he didn't, that the car didn't have any license plates and that there was a black curtain over the back window. So we couldn't see who was inside. And I made a joke about the not having the license plates, obviously it was a stolen car. But the joke fell a little bit flat because a couple of seconds later, the car veered sharply to the right, blocking our car, and then another Mercedes behind us did exactly the same thing. So the driver, who was a, a Lebanese policeman, uh, couldn't go forward or backward. Five men jumped out of each car uh, with Kalashnikov shouting at everyone in the street because the street was crowded with people. Uh, to get out of the way, and then they uh, they grabbed us. I tried to run away uh, and to resist, but they um, they got me and, and clubbed me a bit with uh, rifle butts to get me into the car. Charlie, I remember uh, talking to you as part of the debriefing team uh, in Germany um, uh, after you had escaped, which just in itself uh, was an amazing feat. Uh, as I understand it, Hezbollah... Uh, I believe it was Hezbollah had held you captive for approximately three months, then you were able to escape? It was uh, 62, 62 days exactly. And it was 30 years ago now. It was from June to August of 1987, and it's now 2017. And when you escaped, Charlie, uh, you were on the 10th floor of uh, an apartment, if memory serves me correct. Is that right? It was in 9th or 10th, yes. And... Uh, how did you uh, cope during that time in captivity? Did you, were you always planning on trying to escape? Uh, or uh, what were your thoughts running through your mind as you reflect back on that time frame? Well, in retrospect, I realized that I was lucky that I was held alone. And very rarely was I allowed anything to read. So I had uh, time on my hands. And I was able to use that time to concentrate on any way it was an obvious way to escape, but I did everything I could uh, 
to make it possible. So I used to put uh, notes through the bathroom window. There was a fan, not really a window, but a fan. Whenever the fan was off and they let me into the bathroom, I would push notes out the window in English, French, and Arabic, offering people a reward if they would call certain phone numbers of friends of mine to say where I was. Um, it was it was just, I think the only thing that really kept me going was this idea that I might be able to get myself out. I was also hoping that someone would rescue me, but that didn't happen. I know, uh, quite frankly, uh, we, we had uh, general intelligence of uh, where uh, you might have been uh, held at the time, and, and of course, uh, we had already had our hands full with uh, um, other hostages that had been kidnapped, Westerners, uh, Americans, and of course, uh, uh, the hunt for Bill Buckley, the um, CIA station chief, was, which is really what drove uh, a lot of our efforts uh, early on during the hostage dilemma. Um, when you escaped, Charlie, I, I recall you telling me that um, um, you were able to flag down a taxi and then you went to a hotel and uh, you, you very much uh, wanted uh, to get I, I believe it was the Syrians to go back and arrest the captors. Is that correct? Well, no, what I wanted to do was to get to the airport and fly to London direct from Beirut. Uh, but when I got to the hotel, the security chief of the hotel was afraid that his bowler would know where I was and come back and raid the hotel and take me away. So, so he informed the Syrian army where I was and they came and took control of me. And they then used that politically to say that they had in fact helped in my escape, which they which they hadn't. Uh, my, I didn't really care at the time because I, I was I was out. That's all I cared about. And they, the Syrians dragged dragged me off to Damascus instead of letting me fly from Beirut and, and did a photo op with the Syrian foreign minister and so forth to uh, claim some credit for having helped an American to get out. Sure, I recall that, uh, uh, Charlie. I know uh, if you wind back the clock. Uh, about a year before your abduction uh, during the uh, hijacking of TWA 847. Uh, you were the journalist on the ground there in Beirut at the time. Uh, do you think, uh, in retrospect, that uh, any of the hijackers or Hezbollah members that were involved in that hijacking were actually engaged in your kidnapping? It's not inconceivable, um, because I assume that the kidnapping unit of Hezbollah was a very compact group who knew one another and a lot of the, a lot of Hezbollah members would not be in the loop on on the kidnapping operation because it was a highly secret operation and to this day they deny that they had anything to do with kidnapping um, so it's probably likely but I would have no evidence I don't know who the individuals were who took me or indeed who the individuals were who who hijacked that airplane I know we had uh, several uh uh, infamous characters that were involved in the hijacking, such as uh, Ali Atwa and Hassan Izeldin. Uh, in, uh, they certainly, at least Izeldin, we suspected was involved in uh, some of the Western hostage takings. Uh. Well, the, 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 other, the other name that's often mentioned is Imad Mogniye, who was um, a, apparently one of the architects of the kidnapping policy going back to 1982 when they kidnapped the president of the American University, David Dodge, who was, one of the, who was the first American to be taken. Um, but he, uh, as, as you know, McNeil was subsequently assassinated in Damascus, probably by the Israelis. Yes, indeed. Uh, his uh, fingerprints were under, uh, were, were on a tremendous amount of uh, terrorist attacks and killings and bombings and hijackings and, and hostage taking. So uh, that... Uh, that certainly doesn't surprise, uh, I think, either you or I. Um, in, in retrospect, Charlie, looking at Lebanon uh, in that time frame, uh, do you think uh, that uh, the country um, uh, in, in many ways uh, has changed from uh, that time period? I know you were recently back. Uh, uh, visiting and traveling. Uh, what's your perceptions as you drive down the streets of Beirut uh, uh, and thinking back of in the in the 80s? It's it's the difference of day and night. Um, Lebanon is safe. I can walk anywhere in the streets day or night without without any fear. Hezbollah has rebranded itself as a legitimate political party that on the side has a militia ostensibly to protect 
South Lebanon from Israeli attacks and to assist the Syrian regime in its war against the jihadis in Syria. Um, the nightlife scene in Lebanon is like it was before the war. Uh, business is good. Uh, tourists are coming. Uh, right now, there's a huge international music festival at Baalbek. And Baalbek used to be called the capital of world terror in the days when Abu Nidal was there. And now it's just, it's changed enormously. There is, however, a threat that Lebanon could revert if the Lebanese army should be weakened, if the, the ISIS militants from Syria would escape into Lebanon and foment problems between Sunnis and Shiites in Lebanon. Uh, things could could go wrong. But at the moment, uh, the Lebanese army has taken control of all the border area. Hezbollah has turned over its bases to the Lebanese army. And unfortunately, um, the U.S., which was largely behind this program of beefing up the Lebanese army, is about to cut, cut that foreign aid budget to, Le budget to Lebanon, which may make that border more porous and, and thus make Lebanon slightly vulnerable. Yeah, that's a fascinating look, uh, Charlie. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Uh, now, you have a new book out, uh, Syria Burning, uh, A Short History of Catastrophe. Uh, what's that about? Well, I, I've been going about twice a year into Syria since the war began in 2011 for the New York Review of Books and uh, taking long looks at different parts of Syria and different people in Syria. So I've taken all of that information and the impressions that I gathered uh, and put it put it into the book to try and explain as simply as I can. It's a very short book. It's almost like a handbook uh, to people who are not familiar with Syria, what happened there and why there was a war and why the war is still going on and the foreign powers that are involved um, who are enabling both sides to be armed well enough to prolong a war that most Syrians don't want to take place. And uh, if people are interested in uh, getting the book, I assume uh, they can e visit your website, www.charlesglass.net, or is it also available on Amazon, for example? It's not available on Amazon and some good bookshops. It's from Verso Press. Uh, it's not very expensive, but it's, you know, it's quite a, in a few hours, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's going on in Syria. Well, uh, in, in closing, uh, Charlie, I'd like to ask... Before, before you close, can I, before you close, can I, I just want to say something. Um, a lot of people during the, those days when I was hostage and uh, a lot of other Americans and British and French citizens were hostage, uh, there were complaints that uh, the government bureaucracies didn't care. Um, I don't know whether the bureaucracy cared or not about me, but I, can, I know when I came out and met you and your colleagues, I know how supportive you were to my family while I was, while I was away and they didn't know if I was going to come back alive and how supportive you were to me personally and psychologically and so forth. So I think um, you State Department guys deserve a pat on the back for all the, all the help you, you gave us at that time. And, and as, as you know, I'm not uncritical of American foreign policy. However, um, you, guys, you guys were great. I don't think you could have done anything more than what you did. Well, uh, Charlie, I uh, very much appreciate those very kind words. Uh, I know that uh, um, we certainly tried to uh, locate you, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we just did not have the human intelligence or the tactical intelligence to be able to figure out where any of the hostages were on any given day, uh, uh, but we certainly tried. So um, thank you very much for those kind words, um, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to visit with us today. and. Again, if anybody would like to get a copy of uh, Charlie's book, Syria Burning, A Short History of Catastrophe, uh, it's available at all the usual uh, outlets, uh, and you can also find it on Charlie's website, www.charlesglass.net. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much, Fred.